birds and pumas are largely unknown part of our British wildlife. I certainly knew what I'd seen. With thousands of sightings reported every year, could these big cats be controlling our ecosystem? If they've actually started to control the deer population, or could they be a danger to us all? If we had cats like this in our countryside, yeah, we would have a big problem. Grizzly is a video and animation company. We produce mostly commercial content. On the side, we go and shoot our own sort of projects. Six or seven years ago, I had a quite a strange encounter, which I believed at the time was a black leopard. Knowing how much your brain can play tricks on you is always a question of what if it was just a misidentification. So this is a board of all the recent sightings that we have. Apparently in the New Forest National Park, someone saw a panther with a deer in its mouth. Some of the sightings in the Bournemouth area are quite recent. Multiple eyewitnesses accounted two puma-like animals around the Bournemouth airport. This was in the last two years. We placed a few camera traps around some of the recent sightings. One of the sightings was reported by Chris College. This was only less than two months ago. The security light was uh, triggered below, and I saw the, the animal um, that had come over the fence, and I saw it go into the darkened area of the bushes down there, and then it came along the path here, very clearly to be seen, into that area there, and then disappeared o over the fence. And are you absolutely certain of what you saw? Yes, I could definitely say, say that it was a panther. Chris wasn't the only person to come forward on camera about their experience. Angela from Somerset has had multiple sightings over the years. There in the track was standing in this beautiful show stand, this black animal, flat head, smallish head, strong neck, high withers, sloping top line, hind quarters a dog breeder would die for. Very good bow, nice tight feet, low deep chest, and his long tail going flick, flick, flick. I, mean, I really was extremely stupid that I didn't think it was a letter because I just didn't. I was trying to work out what on earth it was. Uh, anyway, it, it got fed up with looking at us and it just walked off into the undergrowth. So I went down to where it was. So I let all the dogs off the lead and said, what was it? <sighs> Can you believe it? It may sound hard to believe, but the theory of where they came from stands up well. During the 1900s, you could buy pretty much any animal that you wanted, especially with shops like Harrods selling baby elephants, alligators, lions and leopards. Then the government realised that this wasn't very safe, and in 1976 they introduced the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, which stated that no person shall keep any dangerous wild animal except under the authority of a license. The owners now needed to face a choice between building an enclosure with the appropriate size, temperature, ventilation, drainage and so on, or they could just release their animals just as easily and carelessly as they bought them. Whilst most exotic species either died out or were captured, it is believed that, being such adaptable animals, leopards, pumas and lynx were able to breed and live a quiet life in Britain's countryside. Zoo, which is home to the only breeding pair of black leopards, and they call themselves the home of the Exmoor Beast. We're here to meet one of the carnival keepers and talk about this whole phenomenon and meet the leopards ourselves. Hey. Thanks to meet you. Welcome to Exmoor Zoo. We have two black leopards. We also have Puma here, which is also in our British countryside. I remember seeing a leopard probably the best part 15, 16 years ago. I was in a car, literally in a gap in a hedgerow. One of these guys was there. And it stayed there, and then it disappeared into the bushes. You know? Yeah. And you know what you know if you've worked with them for a very long time. It's quite obvious what you're looking at. Um, a lot of the stories, a lot of the folklore, are indeed that. Just stories. You know, so you, you have to <clears throat> effectively separate the wheat from the chaff. This is Zoiza, this is the male. He's a rear cat, so he does like human company, this particular cat. Yeah. Um, but don't get me wrong, if you went in there, he would kill you stone dead and wouldn't think twice about it. But he is. And there's, there's a lot of teeth there, there's a lot of bite pressure. It's a phenomenally powerful animal. That is to trigger a response. I mean, you can only imagine lions and tigers and things, but when they mean it, when this guy means it, the ground shakes. This is not meant as anything other than, hello, blokes. I know him. I don't know him, though. And, um,. Yeah, it's, it's quite intimidating. How come there are more human casualties? They will look for an easy target. 
what do we have? Rabbit, we have pheasant, we have deer, we have sheep, we have goats. That is the target. Um, they would rather eat a couple of rabbits a day than go and tackle something which could actually hurt them. Because as being a predator, if they're injured, they're no longer a predator <laughs> because they can't then go out and hunt for themselves. During our filming at the zoo, we were informed that another carnivore keeper, Ariane, had an encounter with what she believed was a puma. I was walking my dog one night a few weeks ago, and it was about 10 o'clock at night, pitch black, and I just had my torch. The dog started going a bit crazy, barking at something. I shone my torch around, assuming maybe it's just a fox or a badger. And then it was amazing. But at the end of my torch beam, I saw this big cat just walk across the road and jump over the gate into the field and carry on his way. Yeah, you know, there's loads of evidence around that they are about, and now that I've seen it for myself, I'm fully convinced that they're definitely out there. In some places like Exmoor, it seems almost common knowledge that big cats are living around us. John McGowan is the go-to guy for big cats in Dorset and has been studying the animals for years. He joined us for a podcast we filmed last year. As big cats have naturalised, they've actually started to control the deer population, and now we're not getting those spikes in deer populations anymore. They're coming now. So it's actually showing that these top predators are doing their job in controlling not just deer, but badgers, foxes, hares, otters, and all other animals that need to be naturally controlled as well. Back at the zoo, Derek was helping us understand some common misconceptions. When people go, oh, don't be silly, they can't exist. There are two living in here, but so many visitors to the park only ever see one because she blends in. The obvious thing to state is they wouldn't behave like this. Okay. Oh, no. They'd behave like that. She is very much how a leopard would behave, which is being reared by a leopard. If we had cats like this in our country, yeah, we would have a big problem. But that is how a leopard would be. Creatures of the shadow, sleep very quiet, very calm, wait for food, whack back into the shadows. You're looking at an animal which comes from a diverse area. Naturally, snowy regions, rocky escarpments. In certain cities in India, for instance, they actually have urban leopards. So it's a massively, massively adaptable cat. It is the second most widely distributed cat on the earth. The first one, obviously, the domesticated cat. This is the next one down. And that's quite a remarkable thing. Again, it comes back to that same question we pose every day to visitors. Why can't they exist? Unsurprisingly, our camera traps didn't capture any big cats, but the footage highlighted the abundance of food, even in urban areas. Just as we thought the filming was finished, I got a call late at night from someone who told me that both my podcast guest Jonathan McGowan and I knew nothing about big cats in Britain. He told us that he's got this footage of a six-foot leopard. He wants to just sort of educate us, in his words, um, about this case. Understandably, I was eager to meet him, though we met under the condition nor his face, voice, or visage would be on camera. There's a deer in the background. No, that's at 1844. Yeah, 12th of June. Ten minutes later, I got this shot. And that's him leaping straight yeah. past the front of the tree. And the great thing is, you've got a deer looking straight at him. What do you think? Yeah, when I saw it, I thought there was a deer face. Yeah, that's, that was my first yeah. thought. Yeah. yeah, and I've had so many people, I knew he was yeah. going to say that. Yeah. But then, look at the width thickness of that deer's neck there, mm. at the same distance away. That's, that's its eyes reflecting, that's its shoulder where he's leaping up over the tree branch. There's no way that's a deer. So, on reflection, I should have challenged the footage more, um, rather than try and be polite. However, my friend and I both thought the photographs quite clearly resembled a deer jumping across in front of the camera. There is no surprise that there isn't any crystal clear footage or photographs around, considering how brief the encounters are that people have with them, and also considering just how adaptable and how elusive the animals are. It seems very plausible that these big cats are out there, and so the questions that remain are, can their existence be confirmed? If so, can their impact be measured? And what action can be taken to protect both us and the big cats of Britain?